irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona, right here on LA Talk Radio. Reality. I'm Priscilla Leona, producer and host of this show, and we are coming to you live from Los Angeles, California. For 10 years, we have been ranked the number one entertainment career advice show, and this is the show to listen to if you are currently pursuing or dreaming about a career in the entertainment industry. And the guests on this show are going to help you by providing tips, advice, and resource information on how and what it takes to successfully pursue a career in a wide variety of show business professions. And the guests on our show include Emmy winners, Grammy winners, Tony Award winners, reality TV stars, film and music producers, film and television directors, casting directors, talent managers, screenwriters, actors, singers, comedians, writers, scr- I said that once, uh, scripts, supervisors, stunt people, and around December we throw in an entertainment attorney just because they're so important. And if you missed any of our shows, please go to our archive page, which is on the LA Talk radio.com website and search for the name of our show which is question reality or you can search by my name priscilla leona and all of the question reality shows are also available 24 hours a day on itunes google play and stitcher.com under the podcast section and please make sure you get our free mobile app, which is on the home page of the LATalkRadio.com website, located on the right-hand side towards the bottom of the page, because you do not want to miss a show on LA Talk Radio. Oh, my gosh, that rhymes. I love that. I just made that up. Uh, finally, if you want to be a guest or refer someone who's working professionally already uh, to be on the show to promote themselves, uh, showcase their products, their films, Films, their books, their tours, anything, and they genuinely want to help listeners with uh, Sage Career Advice, we want to book you. We still are booking for October, November, and December. There are a couple spots left, so please uh, give us an email. Um, you want to go to the official website, though, not the LA Talk Radio website. You want to go to our official website, which is questionrealityradioshow.com. Questionrealityradioshow.com and click on the contact link. And that is where you submit for interview consideration. So that is where you go. Now, finally, the exciting part, the guest. Now, today we have an actor, producer, and soap opera star. Love that. Uh, (laughs) Love to say soap opera. Soap opera star. Some of the soap operas he... um, my family is very big on soap operas. They watch every single show poppers, so, soap opera, so they know him. And I got a ton of questions, and I said, "No, I am not asking this man these soap opera questions." What they were like? Oh, what happened to it? What did you? They like think it's real. Oh my gosh! So he's been on Passions, uh, Days of Our Lives, Port Charles, and. We'll be discussing today, though, the latest film that he's starring in, uh, along with um, a a gentleman that, when I say the name, you're going to go crazy. Oh, maybe I shouldn't say it. Yeah. Okay, I'll say it. Uh, Gilby Clark from the legendary rock band Guns N' Roses, one of my favorite bands from the 80s. And um, now, of course, Gilby Clark's not here today. It's just our lovely, gorgeous, sexy Christopher Malecki. I guess I didn't even say his name. Christopher Malecki is here. Yes. Um, But the film is called Last Curtain Call. Love that title. Isn't that the best title ever? Um, The film tells the story of an aspiring rock star who's neglected his family over his life long music career and unfortunately 
unfortunately, just as he is about to get his big break in the music industry, he's diagnosed with early onset dementia. And knowing that his life is limited, he tries to make up for lost time with his loved ones. But is it too late? And the only way you're going to find out is if you go and see the movie. And the movie is currently playing um, at the Arena Cine Lounge. And that's 6464 Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood, California. Of course, you have to come all the way to Hollywood to see the film. Well, at least I'm from August 24th through August 30th. After that, hopefully it's a national theatrical release. But from August 24th until August the 30th. Again, it can be seen uh, this week, this week, August 24th. It's not August 24th yet. You still have a couple of days to buy tickets. Uh, and you can go to the website to buy the tickets at arenascreen.com. That's A-R-E-N-A. S C R E E N dot com, arena screen dot com, and then search for last curtain call, and uh, you will be able to buy tickets. Now, you can also find uh, Christopher on Facebook as well. He is all over the place, but uh, you want to check him out and maybe give him a little finger, a good finger, a thumbs up. I shouldn't say (laughs) give him a finger. Give him a little thumbs up. Like him on Facebook.com under Last Curtain Call. He's also on Facebook as Christopher Malecki, M-A-L-E-K-I. He's on Wikipedia. And again, buy those tickets. Now, after you hear him, you are going to want to buy those tickets, but you better get them quick because they're going fast. So um, please, without further ado, let's bring him on now. Welcome, Christopher Malecki. I hope that's how you say your last name, or is it Maliki? <laughs> or is it Malachi? It's Malachi, neither, neither of the above, but you did pretty oh. good, though. Thank you. How are you, Priscilla? Oh. I had three tries that I got it wrong. Malachi. <laughs> Malachi. Yes, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to butcher it again, but that's okay. Well, you can correct me. Now, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I know you got a really, really, really busy week with this huge film coming out. Oh, my gosh. When I heard the storyline, I was just so moved because, as I said to you in a text, my husband's... Um, Two uncles have died of Alzheimer's and dementia-related illnesses. Uh, I've had a friend whose mother died recently. And it just seems like this particular disease is running rampant. I mean, it. I mean, you got, of course, cancer. And now you got Alzheimer's and dementia, which is running, you know, neck and neck with, with, the, with the top disease here. And we want to know um, exactly what was the inspiration for, uh, I, 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 when I looked, I see you did not write the movie, but maybe you could tell us uh, if you were an inspiration in getting someone to write it, um, and how did the movie come to be? Well, basically, uh, by the way, thank you, Priscilla. It's very nice to be here, first of all. Um, basically, the movie was already written, and it's loosely based on a true story. We sort of incorporated the music into that about this character. Uh, my character, uh, he's in a rock band and my actual band that I'm in called Maliki theory does is also in the band. They all have, in the movie, excuse me, they all have small parts, but the band is called Maliki theory, as I said, and they, the uh, band is as itself, but we do all the original music in the movie and everything is done by this band. Yes. I wrote all the lyrics to the music, the movie. Correct. Yes. Okay. So I briefly exp- explain what the film was about, um, in, and I, I guess the inspiration, so it's a true story, so the, was the inspiration from the person who wrote it, was that the story uh, about a member of their family that got Alzheimer's? I mean, a writer usually writes about something that is personal to them or that they, yes. they felt strongly about. So tell us who the writer is and what was the, if you know, what was the inspiration for writing, writing the film? Well, I can't remember the writer's name at this point off the top of my head, but I will say that this was based on a, uh, somebody in his family, yes, that uh, contracted this kind of the disease and uh, everything sort of came to play in that. And the irony in this is that, um, you know, as you said earlier, um, 
you know, this is a disease that's rampant and everybody seems to be all over the place right now. It's a sort of new cancer, as they'd say. But the reality with cancer and this disease, which I saw my father go through, which I know we're going to get into eventually, um, there's no light at the end of the tunnel with this disease, which is why we need the best we can to uh, get a cure for this, because there is no light at the end of the tunnel. And I've seen firsthand what it can do to us, to somebody. And it was my father that caught this disease, unfortunately. And I was there for the whole thing with him, unfortunately, to see him go through this was terrible. And that's why this movie, when we started this film, this was, he was not sick, of course, which is why I took some time off once he was, once he was, uh, he got this disease. And it's just ironic that he happened to, I was portraying his character. And then sure enough, my father guessed his disease after we'd done shooting the film, he was diagnosed. So yes, uh, that's it's solely loosely based as I said. The reality was after the fact he came came sick with this disease. Yeah, yeah. You had um, uh, ironically your father. You had said that your father died from Alzheimer's on August seventeenth, two thousand and seventeen, last year. Which yeah. August you know, August seventh actually August seventh actually yeah oh, August seventh okay. of last year okay that yeah, so that just a year year that you, I got that yeah. correct correct make sure you correct so good, so good. Uh, uh, August yeah uh, so that just recently passed so again I am very yeah. very sorry that you just recently Thank went you. through that I mean it's a very very sore uh, sore spot for us to talk about I hope it's okay if it's not we'll just move no, on no. but what what was ironic good you therapy. said about it was that the date on the film. Uh, when the story takes place, was that uh, the same? There was something ironic about it. The day, you, your, oh, your father died on the date of the film when the story takes place. Was that what you said? Well, we imp- we implemented that into the film uh, just to sort of make it more not necessarily current, but uh, after all this had happened, the realization of it all, and I wanted to impl- implement that in the film to make it more current. And to more or less, uh, you know, as homage to my father, which is the end of the film, obviously, is dedicated to him. But the August 7th thing we, we post in the beginning of it is where the story starts because he goes back and forth with his memories and his, uh, which he does a lot of, uh, his memories come forth backwards and, and thinking about what he's lost, which what this film is about loss and about regret. And uh, basically trying to focus in on what you have. And I say this to every, all of our listeners out there to say, although this sounds kind of cliche is to embrace every moment with our loved ones. And this is true for anything, not just because of a disease, anything can happen as we all know, because we're all in this together. We're all in the human race and uh, tomorrow is guaranteed to no one. So if nothing else, you walk away with this from, from this film with that kind of a thing to say, you know what? I want to go out and ki- give a hug to my mom, my dad, whoever you care about your dog, anybody doesn't matter. If we lose sight, we get caught up in our everyday grind, especially me in this entertain- the entertainment business, as most of your listeners know, it's a tough, tough racket. And you have to find yourself become a little bit sort of, not selfish, but you have to sacrifice and anything in life you want in order to get what you want in life, you have to sacrifice. And that's a, that's a loaded statement, but you can take it any way you want, but you really do. I don't care if you're a bookkeeper or you're an actor or you're a director or you're racing horses, you have to focus and keep your eye on the prize and go after that. So a lot of times you get tunnel vision and you lose the life that's going on on either side of you. So happiness is not a guaranteed thing and you have to create it. You have to create your own existence in life, but you got to try and take advantage of it and don't waste time because tomorrow is promised to no one. Absolutely, Christopher. Now, you are a producer on this film, and I just wanted to to get that information to the listeners of of who the writer was on this wonderful film it was written by john hollis uh from um uh, um, either a movie or a television show it's referenced as relentless that sounds to me like it was a film uh that Mm -hmm. i've seen and it was directed by jennifer tadlock from uh streets of hope and victory by submission and the Mm -hmm. film was produced by alan uh hagan from america 101 Mm -hmm. and jennifer tadlock and you uh our um, uh, our producers also. I think I know Jennifer directs it. I think they said you were a producer, and it's yes. ex- executive produced by Mercedes uh, Arhablu or Arhablu. Mercedes Arablu. 
Yeah. Thank you. There you go with another last name. <laughs> okay. So those are the people that are associated with the film and have done a wonderful job with the film. I saw the trailer, the teaser trailer, which, by the way, everyone can see if you go to YouTube and type in Last Curtain Call. And then make sure you yep. do subscribe or give it a little thumb up. Everywhere you go, you got to just keep your thumb up. Just keep it up and get ready to give everybody else a little thumb. That used to be a bad thing. Now it's a good thing. <laughs> your person a thumb. Uh, now let's it's go true. back a little bit, Christopher, a little bit here. Let's go mm-hmm. back to the beginning. Now you're a native of Glendale, California, right here, a California boy. Growing up, right. Christopher in the Mm -hmm. entertainment capital of the world. From your perspective, not from anybody else's perspective, but from yours, how has the entertainment industry changed? And what I mean by that, it could be the audition process, the casting opportunities, just overall, because you have seen a lot since your 12-year-old eyes. Uh, So Tell us something. People who don't live in California aren't in the entertainment industry or they they live in small towns and they want to come here or they've heard all these stories. Give us something, Christopher. Well, I don't want to be – I started professionally in the union in 1977. I know I'm dating myself, but that's okay. I was 12 years old. That's correct. And uh, the way I've seen the – you know, when I was started on this business, it came to me very easily. Um, You know, I was a cute kid, and I think you go through those changes. I I remember being in school, and they'd come to get me out of school because I had an audition. I was very rarely in school, actually, and you had to maintain a certain average uh, GPA, I should say, uh, to stay in to get your union card. So at the beginning, it it just came so easily, uh, which I think is a is is, – I wasn't hungry. And, uh, you know, cause you, 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 you're going through those changes as a young man. And, uh, and then you start you know, that cute things kind of wearing off and you're sort of in this other category. Uh, it's a tough business. And, uh, I have a daughter and I have a son. And if somebody was to ask me if I want my child to get into this industry, and I hate to say this, I would say, no, it's a tough, tough business. And the way I've seen it change is it's, obviously there's a lot more mediums out there, a lot of different places, a lot more channels out there than there was when I started out, of course. And you would think that would make it easier. And doing all the shows I've done, the amount of work that I've done, of course, you just scratch the surface. And, of course, uh, your listeners can go to IMDb and, and type in my name to oh, see we're the go- Oh, that we're going to hit that. Don't, don't think that I'm done with that because I'm about to do a, a little bullet-pointed list of all my favorite shows that you've been on. So don't worry about that. We're going to hit them, Connie. Nice. We're hitting them. But nice, I understand nice. that you started uh, working in show business at 12 and you were working continuously on Teen Magazine. Now, was I'm not uh, was Teen Magazine sort of like Teen Beat from the 70s and 80s or all the above? Yes, all the above. Uh, you know, you you, uh, you know, you do those interviews for that, the shows. And uh, yeah, and I was you know, I was rubbing elbows with all the guys back in the day. And I don't want to drop names right now. But, you know, there was Ooh, people you, you wanted to be. But drop I, Drop. So, uh-huh. Jack, give me, like, give me one. Give me, like, well, one. Well, I mean, like, the, I, like, the late, late Garrett and Scott Dale yes, and all the guys. These... Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. I was, I was obsessed with Leif Garrett. And, of course, I met yeah. Scott Bale. At, a, at the Brown Derby. He's very, very nice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, mm-hmm. Donny Osmond was, like, gone from the 70s, but, you know, he was still trying, you know. I love my, mm-hmm. I love me some Donny Osmond. I was just like, I'm a little tiny girl, but I still remember. Uh, so, what did you do working on uh, Teen Magazine, hanging out with Leif Garrett and the boys? Well, it wasn't that necessarily hanging, I mean, to the magazine, but they would have their parties, of course. We'd go rub elbows with them, and uh, I, at, at the time, I guess, closer to the eighties, I looked the people that used to think I was Leif Garrett because my hair was long. And, uh, you know, we would do these events and people had me sign autographs. I thought I was Leif Garrett. Oh, I thought you were Leif Garrett. Well, anyway, uh, people at home won't know the difference <laughs> back then, but, uh, he was, a, he's got a year or two on me, you know, they were all drugged out. They thought you were Leif. You look like close enough, close enough. They were dropping the quail. Well, back They're like, yeah. There's Leif, yeah, and it's Christopher. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking a I'm taking You're a fifth right. on the Quaalude thing, though. I'm taking a fifth on that one. But uh, right. besides that, they yeah, were that was the era, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a good time, as I mentioned, and everything came easy to me, and it made me very competitive, as I still am to this day. But I don't, at, at this point in my in my life, uh, there are other things that are more important to me, so I don't take it as serious, you know, when the work comes in or the auditions or what have you. But 
you know, you, you expect after the amount of work that you've done in soaps and, and TV shows and series I've been on when I was younger, that you expect the sort of the, the gates to open up to you once you're available to work again. And it doesn't always happen that way because there's always someone. And, and when you come to another level, you're going to get names that are bigger than you. So when you go into that room, they already have a backup offer for such and such. And uh, they see they, they usually do that to more or less pin you against the person who is either playing hardball and they say, well, we're seeing this guy. So make sure you agree to this, to this price, because we're seeing this guy, Christopher Malachi, or this person over here. So please make sure you, if you guys want, you, your client wants to do this, this role, we're, we're looking at other actors. So it would put me in sort of a different category, which is a good thing, but I was going against bigger names, which, you know, tended to be a problem because it's about marketing and people sell the film overseas, depending on what the name is. But even back then, in the beginning, uh, it just was, it would come so easy to me. It was just flowing. There was work coming. I almost didn't want to do the work because I wanted to play with my friends after school. But I realized, you know, that uh, it's a business. And that's why I, to this day, I'm a much more, uh, my, I have very, very thick skin. Um, and when it comes down to it, um, you always think it's a better guy that's going to get the job. And it's not always the case. There's a lot of politics involved. I mean, you might walk into a room, that producer, that caster, you might remind him of a guy who took his girlfriend in high school. Who knows? It's a, it's a human right. thing, right? You walk in. So you just don't know. And I, in this particular film, uh, I was involved in the casting process. And because I'm an actor primarily, I'm the best guy to audition for for an actor because I'm a guy who's in, who, that's what I do. And I'm more of a giving person. Uh, but a lot of times you walk into a room and it kind of sucks because they'll look at you and they're, they're, you can tell they're not interested five minutes into it. And they're kind of going through the, the motions of, of going through the dialogue with you, even though, A, the project might already be cast. Uh, and they just put you, the, the breakdown out, which is a breakdown is just to, uh, to the agents to let them know what they're casting for. And the roles already cast. They do that just to get uh, sort of a buzz about the project. So you spin your wheels a lot. And you don't know that going in. But you go in and you do your best. You take your time. You, you, you leave your work or you leave your school, whatever it is. And you show up, you do, you do your work, and you show it and give the best darn thing you can do. And it doesn't matter a lot of times because, you know, the, the decision's already been made, unfortunately. I know. And the, and the sad part is that you know, actors have to work so hard just to get a buck to even participate in yeah. the field. You know, everything is so expensive. Headshots, acting classes, website memberships. Uh, real, uh, real quick tip, how would you recommend? Prioritize as a beginning actor when they're on a budget, because I'm telling you, there are so many scam artists out there. Sure. Yep. And you know, I can't stand it. For for a short time before I got into uh, uh, doing soaps, when I was on Passions, actually, before that, I was a photographer, and I would give very good prices. But it was because I hate people that exploit actors, because they come here and they offer this so many ridiculous things out there that offer. Oh, uh, you shoot with me, and then you go to this class, and then we'll try to get you an agent. That's all. The majority of the time is BS. What I would say to your listeners out there, anybody wants to get in the business, I would say this, get headshots, right? And then inundate, go online or buy a book for agents and inundate those agents with headshots or go online, IMDb Pro, for example, and try to get their emails and just send, 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 and also create a reel for yourself because a lot of beginner actors don't have a reel because obviously they haven't done any work yet. What you right. need to do is you need to create a, create a reel, shoot uh, your own stuff, something that least hones into who you are and, uh, you know, shoot a scene and they have it edited properly. So it looks like it could be something theatrical because there's so many independent films coming up every single day. Nobody can keep tabs on it. You know, unless it's some big, big, uh, 10 million, hundred million dollar blockbuster, then people know those films. But reality is they don't know all of them. So it's about smoke and mirrors. Uh, you got to learn to be a good BS in this business too. Uh, it's not about where, you, where you've been, it's where you're at at that moment, because it doesn't really matter. You're only as good as your last gig. And going into this, you need to remember that. And you can't break up or break down if it doesn't follow through for you. Because, like, for example, you look at these American Idol, for example, and the guy gets, gets cut and he breaks down. And that's fine. That's natural. But that's going to come a thousand times in this industry. It's just going to come. You have to – key is to know who you are. And that may sound kind of generic and sort of cliche, but it's a big deal. It took me years to figure that out. Say, this is who I am. I, you need to embrace your strengths. For example, I play a lot of played a lot of bad guys my whole life and my whole career. And so I understand that. Now that I'm a bad guy, I play a killer on TV. It doesn't mean I'm actually a killer in real life, obviously. But you need to hone in on what, what your strengths are and bring you to each character you read. And also, when you read your, your material, 
You need to retype it yourself, take out all the punctuations, because the punctuations were put in there by the writer. But you need to make it your own. For example, there's a parenthesis there, or, or, or comma. It doesn't mean you're going to stop speaking there. Make it your own, because nobody speaks like you do. Nobody looks like you do. You're an individual, and that's what casting wants to see. They don't want to see you bring in a caricature of somebody. You need to bring you to the table, because there's nobody, no one like you in the world on the planet. You're an original. You need to bring that to the table. Oh, my God. That's such fantastic news. I have never heard that tip to type it and take out all the punctuation. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That is a really yep. great tip. If you had to give um, three, just three characteristic traits that it takes to make it as a successful actor, what would you say? Like persistence, you know, not cliche ones. Everybody does no. that one. Well, you know, no, that's you know, number, you that's, need no. it. But that's a, that speaks to what you said. Persistence, thick skin, and focus. You need to stay focused. I, there's three words I used to live by, and it was sacrifice, believe, and faith. You have to sacrifice what you want. You have to believe in what you want. And you have to have faith in who you are and what you want. Those three things are tied together. And I would have tattooed that on my body a long time ago, but my dad wouldn't have had it, so I didn't do it. <laughs> but those are three oh. words I stand by. Uh, yeah, those are three words. And it, it goes a long way. And it's really... I think the problem is uh, so that a lot of people overthink things like we do in life, okay? You can't overthink anything when it comes to this business, when it comes to your material. You have to know, you have to have a direction, you have to have a reason, and when you're speaking about something in a scene, you have to have an end, you have to have an idea of what you want from that person you're talking to. I don't care if it's a small role and you're telling the guy, uh, hey, hi, I have a cup of coffee, please, with uh, two cubes of sugar. This is kind of a weird, weird example, but you have to believe uh, I want this reason why I want two cup, a cup of coffee. And I like two cups of uh, two things of sugar because uh, too much sugar gets me this or gets me that. You have to really do go through it. And you have to have layers to your character layers. That's what makes it interesting. Anybody, anyone can read material. Anybody can, you have to take chances, but you can't be married to that, that choice because in the room, that director or that cast director will say, no, no, I don't like it. Go this direction. If you're too locked up on those words, it's you, 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 it's going to be a doom, doomsday for you. And I'll tell you I something know. else. You cannot. You have to know the material. Always hold your material in your hand. And that's the only time you won't be able to do that is if you're testing for a soap. They do not. If you're testing, that means the material's got to go away, and you, they're going to put you in a room. They're going to actually get you on the set, and you're going to actually do the exact thing you'll be doing if you're on this the soap. But in film, you're testing the same thing. But normally speaking, in an audition, even though you know those words, which you should know them, before you can throw that, those words away and make it your own, you have to know them. You have to know them. And then hold the material in your hand at all times. Because what that tells the people that you're reading for is that you're not married to the words and it's still a work in progress. A lot I wish somebody of people, told me this stuff years ago, by the way. I know! That's what I was going to... That You're like, <laughs> you're psychic here. Because I was going to ask you, what if... if what are, again, three things, because I don't want to be too much, but I, you pretty much have said it because one of my questions was, what are three things that if you could go back and tell yourself before you got started uh, as an actor, what tips or advice would you give your little 12-year-old self? So you kind of well, covered them all. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of covered them, but, but again, it, it's really about uh, my 12-year-old self would be to say, truly really know who you are. And that's a hard thing to tell a 12 year old because the 12 year old wants to go out and play with his friends and he gets kind of bummed right. out when the phone rings. Of course you kill for that now when you're older, because when your phone yeah. rings, your mom's gonna, you got it. Or, Hey, we got to yeah. go. We got this audition. <laughs> no after school sports for you, son. Uh, you got to do this. And anytime somebody would walk into the, to my class with a note, I knew it was for me. I started packing my bags. I know I'm leaving for an audition. Oh, and uh, love, that was it. I love it. And it, made, like, it made me very popular. <laughs> With the girls, <laughs> exactly. I would imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, let me ask oh, yeah. You. I get, mm -hmm. Christopher, I get a lot of questions from aspiring actors who are very, very nerve, either one, are very, very nervous to do this or uh -huh. don't want to do this at all. 
it is this what advice how do you successfully network and market yourself at these little you know how you have to go to the little networkers and the fundraisers and the little parties and you and you and your target as an actor there's there's different steps like for example people this is to my audience if you're an actor your target people to network with are going to be uh, casting directors directors producers if you're a director it's mostly producers, but you still want to do the actors. If it's a producer, it's an executive producer in a studio. So you have your like little circles that you want to focus on. But of course, everybody should be treated equally and inclusive. Now, not everyone is a natural networker and marketer of themselves and their work. Because as an actor, you are a business. You are an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So you have to be the sales department, the marketing department, the accounting department, the, the administrator. You got to be everything. But a lot of actors say that they are extremely intimidated being around casting directors and directors because, you know, these people can smell desperation. And then I have been mm -hmm. personally a witness to actors overselling themselves or not selling themselves or reeking of desperation or not acting like they're interested. What is the perfect combination for a person who's not a natural networker? Well, I'll say this. Obviously, it's about who you know in this industry, okay? But desperation, you hit on the head, is a very unattractive trait. I don't care if you're at the nightclub, it's 1.30 at night, you want to meet a girl, yeah, the girl knows what you want, it's 1.30 at night, and you waited too long. And I hate to use that as an analogy, but, but, but the idea is it's a very unattractive trait. People have to understand, the nerves, you have to use those nerves. You have to use it. And I know that's a tough thing to try to explain, but everybody gets nervous. You watch any of these documentaries or any of these uh, shows about these musicians or actors, they still get nervous because that's what keeps you going. That feeling you get when you're on stage, uh, be it doing theater, which I recommend to people also, but to do uh, any kind of thing, that feeling that you get when you disappear in that character is, is something you cannot explain. And that's what everybody is trying to recapture. Um, again, People have to understand, when you go in that room, that, that casting director, he wants you to do well. He's not your enemy. He's not your foe. He wants you to do well. And he brought you in, he or she brought you in for a reason. Because A, they know your worth. B, you have the look they're looking for. You wouldn't be there for any other reason. And of course, other, there are other uh, factors involved, as I mentioned earlier on in this conversation, that still things could be cast. But the majority of the time, you're there because they want you to do well. So you cannot think about that. That guy sitting across from you or that girl sitting across from you, she bleeds just like you do. So you cut them, they're going to bleed. So they're on the same page as you. And the reality is, although they have the, they have the ability to bring you in, once the producer sees you, they're going to they're gonna talk to each other, of course, after the fact. But that person going in is your friend. You can't think about them and be, and be going in and feel intimidated by them or they're, they're better than you or bigger than you. They're no better or bigger. And a lot of times, and I'll tell you something, I found this out. A lot of those cast directors, especially early on in my career, were like frustrated actors who now want to be in the position to have a little bit of a power thing. And I've met a lot, a lot of really rude people uh, in, uh, in this industry who have been um, on the other side of the table who have that control, and they exploit it, unfortunately. And that's why it's a very, very tough business for anyone involved. And you hear a lot of bad stories out there where kids get exploited and people get exploited, especially for women too, of course. And that's a, that's a big thing. And, and I feel bad about that. And a lot of these uh, people get these pictures, for example, that look like they're, they're shot 20 years ago. And I know a lot of women have dealt with that. And they, they, they oh, touch up terrible. pictures. Oh, and a lot right now, terrible. it's not even hard copy anymore. It's, it's all about stuff on the internet. So it really, the, you usually don't ever bring a, a hard copy into the room anymore because they don't want them. They're, it's really non-existent. You take your pictures, yeah. and you shouldn't spend a lot of money on pictures, by the way, either. You only need two or three shots. And that's all you need. It's going to go online. So a lot of times, about 90% of casting, they don't want a hard copy anymore. They don't want it. Uh, you're going to go in the room, and they already have your stuff. They're going to put you on tape. And... You have to keep in mind, bring in a couple of choices when you go into the room when, with your reading, by the way. Absolutely. So I would say that def definitely there's a lot, lot of sharks out there, a lot of snakes out there, and yeah. it's hard to trust anybody in this business. If it sounds too good to be true, it's because it is. Mm -hmm. it means it's true. It's too good to be true, and it's not real. I'm yeah. sorry, that's a harsh reality. I, I 
I, I, I wanted to get uh, your opinion real quick, and then we're going to move on to your projects. Uh, a, the, a lot of people ask me, because I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you heard how they have actually been arresting casting directors and uh, mm -hmm. people who hold these acting workshops. And um, mm -hmm. they've made all – now, I have been to these things. Um, I actually feel like I've gone to legitimate ones. I don't think I have ever, ever – been to one where it, there was a casting director that was doing something um, illegitimate because you know I've been in the business for a very long time and I can spot a scam artist like right away it's like ding mm -hmm. ding 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 but and I've never been but I have heard horror stories what is your advice to um, new actors who because they're still they're rounding them up basically for those people who are not familiar with this um, if you come to California or pretty much anywhere now there are people who have what they call and I'm going to put air quotes on these casting director workshops so what they do is they mm -hmm. hire these again air quotes casting directors who come and they they have actors, they charge you a price, then you come in and you mm -hmm. read for them and they may or may not give you a note and then they say thank you. So you're going to pay anywhere from $40 to $80. You go in, it's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of people. You read aside, you get in front of a casting director who has these you know, credits and then they do what's called a disclaimer at the beginning of the class and say this is not for employment, this is just for education. Well, ha 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 on that. And um, But good things and bad things can come from these classes. One, you know, you have casting directors who are there to legitimately look and find honestly they're not supposed to but come on we're humans as christopher said so they are there and they are seeking talent for projects they're casting but they are also there to give tips and again advice mm -hmm. and a lot of times what they do is you go up there you read your sign they go okay great thanks and then the next person mm -hmm. comes up so what has happened is these actors yep. are like what the hell is going on i paid 40 to 80 dollars i don't want to hear great thanks next i want some advice i want some tips i want you to tell me you know what am i doing wrong and that wasn't happening so what happened was there was a crackdown uh, a lot of casting directors were arrested and there and there we are and now casting workshops have gotten a bad rap but they are not all bad H how mm. can you distinguish what is your perspective on that because you might you know think different well i have not done sure i've not done many of those but they're absolutely i'm not going to con condemn those because they're actually very good ones out there you're starting That's out right. the business you have nothing to lose other than a few dollars That's what right. you need to do when you get the name of that person hey, they want to make money too uh and they don't probably don't make as much as they should be i guess some of these cast members but there's a lot of reputable people to do those things, and there's also agents to do those things. So I would recommend doing those, but to do the background on those people. That IMDb Pro, I say yeah. Pro because I need Pro. You have to pay for that. It's like $100 a year. But I, yep. I, 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 I definitely, and I don't have any stock in it. I'm saying that's a good one to do because it gives you a lot more information on whoever it is you're looking in to see. Right. But I definitely would recommend doing those because I know people have gotten work from those. And the agents that come, you just look them up. And a majority of them, a lot of them, not majority, a lot of them are, are reputable. And they will probably throw you a bone maybe and give you that, that small role on that project. And it can't hurt. Because, look, you're going to spend money in this industry. You're going to – it's called sacrifice, like I told you about at the beginning of this, of this, uh, this interview. Um, you can definitely seek it out and just look those people up. And this is a business of smoke and mirrors, yes. and that's fine. You give, you give them what you're getting. You give them smoke and mirrors back when it comes to your yes. acting, what you've done. That's fine. Create some things, alias things. Put them out there. But the point is you, you, I would recommend going to some of those workshops or some reputable ones. No names I can drop right now for you. I'm not going to because I don't know yeah. what's on my head. Well, they should be uh, able to do that themselves because the bottom yeah. line, Christopher, is you cannot rely on word of mouth anymore because a lot of times there's what's called payola. They get kickbacks. But the bottom line with anything, even if it's not the entertainment industry, for your 
own personal safety, you have to do fact checking. You have to do due diligence. You've got to look it up. Google, 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 Google is your best friend. And in the entertainment mm-hmm. industry, Google plus IMDb. It is uh, mm-hmm. IMDb.com. It stands for International pro. Movie Database. And you want to get pro. Uh, just the right. regular one is just to look up, you know, actors and credits and stuff. But the pro yeah. is really great because it gives yeah. the name. Say, for example, you wanted to look up Demi Moore. You look up Demi Moore on the right hand mm-hmm. side, you're going to see who her agent is, her production company, yep. her talent manager, how to get her PR yep. people, how to get in touch with her. And that's very important. And uh, usually legitimate people will have their credits listed there and they will have their mm-hmm. representatives. So definitely IMDB Pro. Now let's get to the fun part. You, Christopher, mm-hmm. you have so many films and episodic TV shows on uh-huh. your little belt notches and it would take an enormous amount of time to list all of them but Mm -hmm. i wanted to mention some of my absolute favorites that you were on um a lot of people may not know this but you were david proval on the sopranos billy worth on the lost Mm -hmm. boys albert is Mm -hmm. obsessed with Kiefer sutherland in 24 by the way and he's lost he's watching the lost boys forever um the lovable of course who Everybody knows you and remembers you. The lovable bad boy Spike, Spike Lester <laughs> on Passion. You were on yes. one of my favorite shows, Beverly Hills 90210, uh, Party yep. of Five, which I loved. Mm-hmm. Uh, you had recurring roles on Santa Barbara, The Bold and Beautiful, mm-hmm. Pacific Blue, Days of Our Lives. Um, but I had to bring out what my absolute favorite CSI New York. Oh my God, I love that mm-hmm. show. I love Gary Denise. Uh, Denise. Um, and of course, you've done so many characters in film and television that really have really, you've really rocked the roles. And well, that kind of rise, you rock the roles. You rock the roles, and um, you have just done so many. So let me ask you from your mm-hmm. perspective, your opinion, what was your absolute favorite role to do and why? All right. Well, that's, uh, it's just- you just said, uh, I, I liked uh, the character I played on Passions because it was the longest character. I've done over 300 episodes. And that character uh, I enjoyed immensely because I not only learned a lot working on that show, because, uh, first of all, a lot of soap operas get a bad rap. And I know there's a lot of bad work out there for anybody, for any kind of TV show. But, you know, uh, on soaps, I mean, you can do up to 45 pages a day. And you have Woo! to be off book and you are you yeah, you could do three shows in one day or you lose your job. But that character I started with three episodes and I had no name. I was a club owner. That's what they called my character. And they said it would de- it would determine on how well the character did would de- would de- 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 decide whether or not it would go further. And uh so obviously it did, and then I got this name Spike, and then of course uh the first couple of episodes I think I wore my own clothes actually. Uh, <laughs> they added to it, but it was primarily the same yeah. So, uh, again, it was club owner, but, uh, I liked that character a lot because I learned a lot, particularly working on another uh, soap before that, which was called Fort Charles. I didn't make the character interesting. And this is where I tell you about making choices or for actors, because I just made him, he was just a, an a-hole basically. He wasn't a nice guy. And I knew on Fort Charles, they would see this character come and they go, Oh, there's this, this, this jerk again. And I didn't make him interesting. There was no layers to him. So if you've seen Spike, my character Spike on Passion, you know he was—he did the most horrendous things from murdering people, to, uh, mm-hmm. selling his wife for prostitution, <laughs> for selling his baby, so many things. And I thought to myself, how am I going to make this guy likable? I mean, oh. I, I tell you what, and, and they told me initially in the beginning, don't go to the chat rooms because you're going to, you know, it might hurt your feelings, all the stuff you read. Well, of course, first thing I did was go to the chat room. <laughs> In the beginning, in the beginning, people were like, uh, oh, this guy's a jerk. But after a while, they felt sympathetic toward me, which is exactly what I was trying to do. Because they thought, there's got to be a reason. This is your job as an actor. This is your work to put in. You have to make him, uh, you have to put a question mark to why is he doing these things? There's got to be a reason. You have to make him likable. Likable is the key word here, likable. Because anybody can be a bad guy. Anybody can be a jerk. And back to Port Charles. I'll never forget that. They killed me off on my birthday. I'll never forget it. Uh, because the guy was just not a likable guy. He just, uh, the jerk came in, but I learned from it. 
I also learned to make it your own, as I told you uh, several times already in, in, in this, uh, this dialogue we're having, that you have to make it your own. You have to make him likable. Everybody, no matter who it is, has got to be likable. There's got to be some redeeming quality in that character or the audience will lose interest. You're just a jerk. Here he comes. I hope he dies. Nobody cares. Of course, I heard that too, but the majority of the time, it was all positive. Like, oh, God, Spike is this, he's that. You know what? I like him so much. He's funny. He's this. I, made, I, I played the opposite, which is another thing I want to mention. It's good to play the opposite. You know, instead of telling somebody, oh, uh, the line is, I'm going to kill you. And the guy says, I'm going to kill you. And he's all, he's all, uh, uh, all, all, get, get, all excited about it. And he's telling the guy, I'm gonna kill. anybody can scream, I'm going to kill you. But you got to make it interesting. You have to say under your breath, however it's going to be. You know, you got to make it interesting. Why you tell going to kill them? You have to, it's on the delivery. But now, you can't you- just go generic. Now, 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 that is excellent advice for the actor, but did you ever mm-hmm. get pushback from the director who may not see the character the way you did? Nope. And if so, how do you think? Okay, so they liked everything nope. you did. But that does happen. Yeah. Like, ca- actors will say, okay, well, I see the character this way, and then the director's like, nope, I see the character this way. Yeah. And you've well, seen that happen because you've worked on, like, thousands of shows. What well, is the best me... way to handle it for the actor? Well, uh, if we're talking about daytime, they want, they have so much, they're doing so much work every single day. The producers are in the booth. It's a small area. They always want to get through the pages. And for example, I worked with certain actors, names I won't mention. And they're like, Chris, look, I'm just going to look at, like, I'm looking at your forehead. I just got to get through this dialogue. Well, to me, I'm like, I want to be triggered to say my next line. And I've studied, uh, we'll hopefully get this later on what place I've studied uh, uh, the method, which I've studied, which I highly recommend. We'll get that later if you'd like. But I, I, I would say to myself, this is my ride. That's fine. But I'm going to experience this and enjoy this journey that I'm on right now. And if this actor who I'm in the scene with wants to just run their line, that's their problem. You know, that's their thing. That's their, that's their, this is my journey, though. And it's not about being selfish. It's about the acting. The key is listening. You need to listen. That's acting 101. You need to listen. And a lot of actors, you know, they're so in, ingrained. Oh. Those words are so ingrained in their brain that they're not listening to the guy says. The guy may say, change the line. Instead of saying, what time is it? He may say, hey, uh. Uh, you want a glass of water? And you're like, yeah, it's six o'clock. But that wasn't the question because you're not yep. listening. Yep. He's so Because he's thinking about what's going to come next. He's not in the moment. He's waiting he for acting, his line. He's waiting for his line. He's like, yep. Yep. The acting They're, truthfully under imaginary circumstances. That's the yeah. phrase. Acting yeah. truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Yeah. That's and acting 101. Yeah. Yeah. And that is, uh, and you can always see it right in their eyes. So anyway, let, we've got a couple minutes and I want to get back to our wonderful, you have given a, a incredible tips and advice. Gosh, I would love Thank to you. have you back if you ever have time in the future uh, to just talk Please. about soap opera, because I cannot tell you how many people want to know about the world of soap operas and uh, not many people have have worked on soap opera so you're one of mm-hmm. the few people that i have in my collection now i'm going to say my mm-hmm. collection my question reality collection of superstars sure. super soap opera stars mm-hmm. so we'd love to have you back whenever you're available but sure. i want to bring back the film let's focus on that um it is going to be i am coming to the premiere on the 23rd uh it's going to be awesome. playing at the arena cine lounge 6464 sunset boulevard um this film, highly recommend it for anyone. I, I cannot imagine there's not a person that you have known in your life that hasn't either had a family member or a friend who's had Alzheimer's or dementia or has died from this disease as a result. There are over 232 different diseases that are under the umbrella of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's and dementia, mm-hmm. just like being a psychotic, uh, it's kind mm-hmm. of the same thing. So uh, if, if you have not experienced it, people yet, there is a possibility that you will. So I would imagine there's lots of stuff in this movie that you are going to want to know and just to go mm-hmm. through the experience. Real quick, uh, why mm-hmm. should people come to the film who have not had and have not been touched by Alzheimer's and dementia. Why should they come? It's like, why should I come? I'm not interested in that subject. Why should they? Right. Well, there's a lot of, also, there's a lot of music in this movie also, but it, it, I think it, it's not about really dementia. The idea it's about people uh, trying to respect what they have in life at their disposal, their family, that a lot of times we take for granted. You think you're going to go with it for a cup of coffee or a 
cops and they'll come back. Anything can happen on the highway. This film is about helping you re, uh, to, 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 to appreciate what you have. And it's about loss and it's about regret. A lot of us have that. And regret to me, as they say, is like a bag of rocks we carry around with us, which is not a healthy thing. Uh, but this film will give you an idea of what it's like to uh, sort of to, to remind you of what you have. And it might be too late. So you need to you need to act on it now. And you need to really, really focus on people in your life that you love and to remember that tomorrow is not promised to anyone. Unfortunately for this character, you know, once he finds this out, it's too late for him. And then oh. things start happening. Um, there's, there's, I, I would say I would Don't compare the film. And I'm not, <laughs> no, no. I would compare it a little bit to the movie Sixth Sense is all I'm going to say. Ah, ooh, um, I love but, it. But, but the reality is, is that what you think is reality is not reality. Ooh. And it might be something else you're looking at. It might be your, your imagination. It might be your past. It might be really what's going on in front of you. But mm. this film will help you. I would hope this is about it's, this movie will pull at your your heartstrings. It's it, it, it's an uplifting movie to an extent, but then again, it's a, it's a real it's real, and it's about Got current uh, things that are going on in the world today. So I oh, think it's it's, it's imperative for everyone to go see it. Yeah. Everybody wants also to want to mention. It. Yeah, go ahead. I also might mention the day that it starts in the theater. It'll also be up on prime time. Also, I believe uh, prime uh, prime time Amazon Prime Time. I believe. Oh, on, Amazon Prime. Yes, Amazon which prime. I I can I don't. Yes, I believe I okay. could find time, but yeah, I don't know everything, but, but it okay. will be in the theater. Hopefully we'll get a longer run out of this because the reason why it's take long to get this film out was because I was dealing with my father. So it kind of yep. held things up on post-production yep. and, uh, my hands were full and back to what we were talking about. It made me realize that the most important things I, like I sacrificed a lot for this business and I, I, I lost a lot because of it. Uh, it may be a stronger person, a better person than I am today as a grown man, of course, but I, I've also made me realize that really what's important and the industry or whatever it is you're doing in your life is not the most important thing. Absolutely. The people around you, your 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 support group, that's the most important that's, thing. And uh, I hate uh, to sound cliche uh, no, or corny, but that's so, true. It's so real. And so we gotta end now. And I wanna thank Mr. Christopher Malecki for coming on. You wanna go see the movie August twenty fourth through the thirtieth. It's called Last Please. Curtain Call. It has legendary rock band guy, Gilby Clark from Guns N' Roses. So if anything you wanna see him, Christopher's gonna be playing some music. I imagine Gilby Clark's gonna be playing some music. So you don't even wanna miss that. So Meet so me I'll there. there. I'll be there Thursday. I will be there if you yeah. want to meet me. August 23rd, uh, Arena Cine Lounge. The premiere. The premiere is August 24th. Uh, why am no, I no, going the premiere is the 23rd. 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 Okay, 23rd. This information 24th that I've gotten. Wait, okay, so it opens. So I'm, getting, I'm thanking gosh now because I'm like, why am I going on the 23rd when the 24th it opens? Okay, I'll be there the 23rd. It's the premiere. Okay, okay so you're going so to the premiere. You're a big shot. That's why. <laughs> I'm going to the premiere. Okay, so everybody else, sorry. 24, August 24th through the 30th, go to the website, arenascreen.com, and get your tickets and check it out on Facebook, uh, Last Curtain Call. Thank you, Christopher, for coming on. Get in contact with me so you can come on next year, okay? For sure, hon. Thank you so much. Love you. Love to see you soon. And uh, uh, everybody out there, go after your dreams. Don't let anyone get in front of you. Do what you want to do in life, but just uh, live in the moment. Embrace it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this is our last curtain call. We'll see you next week on Question Reality. Bye. Bye bye. You're listening to Question Reality with Priscilla Leona. Right here on L.A. Talk Radio.